Bless your name. We thank you for this day. Lord, you've given everything that we have for life and for godliness is found in you. We bless your holy name. Lord God, let our eyes just be fixed upon you. Let us be followers of you in every sense of that word, not just in, in word of acknowledgement, but in our actions, in our deeds, and even our thoughts. Lord, we give honor and glory to you this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Well, good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Thank you for uh, being willing to lose an hour's sleep, but still come to church, amen? amen. Let's believe God that through that, that God is just going to bless you in some special ways. Amen. Well, we've been talking, if you've been following all along the last number of weeks, we've been talking about preparing for the harvest, that going into the new year, that was the, the vision, the word that God gave me and the staff, just the fact that there's, there's a harvest that needs to be reaped. Amen. In fact, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, lifted up his eyes and he said, look it, the fields are white for harvest. You know, pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers. For the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Amen. So do we have any laborers here? I hope so. I hope so. Amen. And so that's what we've been talking about and encouraging one another with over the last number of weeks. And in fact, as an act of faith, we talked about the fact that if you're going to have a harvest, you got to do what? you got to sow some seed. And so we gave each of you about six weeks ago a little packet of seeds at one of the services, and, and you were told, don't look until you're told. But I saw people out in the lobby, everybody's looking to see what's in there, and they were a little confused, wondering what was in that little envelope. But uh, you, you put it back, after you dumped it out, you put it back in. I saw you, just so you know, I saw you. And uh, so what happened is that day at both services, you came up and you planted seed here in, the, in, in here. And these are flowers. They're actually, every, every after church on Sunday, we take them upstairs where it's warm. We have growing lights. We water them. We care for them. And then every Sunday morning, we bring them back down here. And we noticed about three weeks ago, a weed in our flower beds. One of you sowed a bad seed. Just so you know. Now, it's not your fault. We gave you the seeds. So I can't really hold you directly responsible. In a sense, it comes back to me, right? But then it goes back to the company we bought the seeds from. But somehow, a weed got mixed in with the good seed. And so it has begun to grow. At first, it was just a little thing. And then it has grown into this thing. It's massive. Just a minute. Let me just unravel here. Look at this thing. Just, here it is. I got, I got a picture of what it was doing in my office. So there, there one day I walked in and it had grabbed hold of the light there. And every day, that's day, next day, next day. That's how fast this stupid thing was growing. And it just shows, I think, what weeds can do in our lives, right? It, it literally, here's what it's doing. It's taking nutrients out of the ground. It's, it's providing shade here. In fact, if you look where all these, the weed was, these plants aren't doing as well here. And literally, it's the same in your life and in mine that when we allow, let go of me, when we allow weeds to grow in our lives, things that don't belong there, it will choke and it will take out the good things that you have in your life. And so last week, we talked about a couple of things, right? A couple of steps. And the first step is what? Realize you got a weed. Sometimes we're not willing to acknowledge we got a problem. You know, and that is just so, so important. If you're unwilling to do that, not even God can help you, all right? And so it's important to, to admit and confess and believe God, to, to say, look it, I got this problem. And then the next step is what? You can't just admit it and just carry on doing what you're doing. You have to do what we called last week, mitigate it. And that means damage control, deal with it. And so I didn't do this at the first service, but I'm going to do it at the second service. It is time to mitigate this weed. Amen. Time to do some damage control. So I borrowed, uh, we have grandchildren that come to our house all the time, so I got the safety scissors, probably good for me anyways. So let me just get down here. Let's find out where this little sucker is growing. I know it was out near the edge here somewhere. Ah, there he is. <laughs> okay, he's going. Now again, I could yank him out, but then it would damage all the ones that are around. So there it is. It's done. Just like that. There it is. Gone. Now, if it sprouts up again, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep chopping it, right? That's what I'm going to do. And so here's the thing. That's what you and I have to do in our lives. We have to, you know, nip it at the root, so to speak. Get to the bottom so it's no longer entangling itself in our lives. And that's what we talked about last week. So I want to move forward now. Again, we're still talking about the harvest and the importance of the harvest. But 
I'm going to ask, it's a question. And you're going to think, this is a little bit kind of like, whoa, kind of way out here. But let me tell you something. It means a lot to the harvest. And here's the question. You know, are we staying or are we going? And so that, what's that got to do with the harvest? Are we staying or are we going? I'm going to ask that question again at the end and, and we'll pull this thing all together. But I promise you, if you stay with me, you'll have an understanding of why we're talking about this subject, all right? Here's the thing. If your understanding of future events do not line up with God's word, it will affect how you view and act on the harvest today, all right? That's really, really important. So let's look at the scriptures. Matthew 24, 36 says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, About the day or the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And this scripture is talking about the second return of Christ. And it can also be talking about the catching up of the church to go to heaven as well, or a combination of those two things. But basically, it's talking about the future. And that we don't know the day or the hour of that event. There was a guy back in, and I remember this, back in 1988, Edgar Wisenot. And he wrote a book, uh, and it said this, 88 reasons why Jesus is going to return in 1988. All right, and he had the date. He had it all figured out within a certain week period of time. Guess what? That day came and went. So in 1989, he said, he wrote another book, 89 reasons why Jesus is going to return in 1989. Guess what? Jesus didn't return, right? And then in 1993, he wrote another book. 1994, he wrote another book. And then finally, he dies in 2001. You know, listen to me. His name was Edgar Wisenot. He's not wise. Don't listen to him. You know, even his name, you know, tells you not to listen. And the thing is, lots of people have predicted the return of Christ or the catching away of the church. And those dates have come and gone. And what can happen for you and I? We get hardened about it. We're like, oh, wow, well, you, know, you know, just as in the times of, of Noah, you know, people were, were eating and drinking, but then the flood came, right? You know, the idea is that one day, in fact, let me tell you something right now, and you can take that this is a word of certainty. Jesus' return is more close now than it's ever been. Now, what I mean by that, it's more close now. And listen, if Jesus is talking about this from 2,000 years ago, can I tell you, he's closer now than he's ever been. And we should be aware of it. So the thing is, there are two extremes of people concerning the return of Christ, all right? Now, if you're in either one of these categories, just keep looking at me, smiling, okay? And, and no one will say, oh, that, they're one of them, all right? So, so I'm going to talk about these two extremes but then I'm going to talk about where I believe you and I need to be, all right? So the one extreme is what I call the escapist. Now, the escapist is the people that are, are like this all the time. And you come along to them and you're like, what are you looking at? Well, Jesus is going to return like any moment. And I just want to be watching for his return. And then you might say to that person, but hold it, we got some stuff we got to do now. Ah, no, no, that doesn't matter. You know, I, I don't need any savings. I don't need to worry about Social Security because Jesus is going to return. It doesn't matter. You know, and, and they're just so fixated on heaven, all right? So the, that's that one camp, all right? So can you see some issues maybe with a person like that? Okay, so there's that person. Again, if it's you, just keep looking at me, smile, won't know it's you. Okay, then you have the other side. I call them the doomsday preppers. All right, now here's what they're doing. They're gathering canned goods. They're gathering, you know, all kinds of noodles and sauces, and they've got a little bit of chlorine to add to big jugs of water, and they've got bunkers underneath their house or in their backyard. And, and when you talk to them, they're running around like a scared rabbit all the time, like scurrying around, and you're like, what are you doing? Like, oh, man, don't you know the end is near? And, and man, all hell's going to break loose, and we got to be ready to go through the tribulation. It's going to be horrible. You know, and, and, and so you got that group. And, and so you can see you have these extreme camps, right? But where's the truth lie? Well, here's the thing. Should we be looking towards the return of Jesus? Yes. He's coming. The Bible says he's going to come in the east. It's going to be a trumpet call. He is going to return. And so should we, you know, be aware that that's going to happen? Absolutely. Now, here's the other side of it. Should we be prepared when trials and tribulations of life come along? Yes, we should. I remember uh, back in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, that the power was out here in the middle of the winter for about 10 days. Middle of the winter. Now listen, there were people scrambling. No gas stations could work because they need power to run the pumps to pump the gas. You know, so it was bad. For 10 days, people were freaking out. You know, this is the end kind of thing. And then for, for many, though, 
who were smart enough. They had, you know, maybe 15, 20 gallons of gas in some buckets in, in their garage or in cans in their garage. They had a little spaghetti and, and some meatballs stuck in their freezer. You know, they, they, in other words, they were prepared to a certain level for the small tribulations that come. And so somewhere in the middle is where you and I should be. Aware that Jesus is going to return, but prepared for some of the events that are going to happen in this life. Can you say amen to that? And so that needs to be our attitude. Now, I'm going to go back to this at the end and kind of ask that question again. Are we staying or are we going, all right? But what I want to focus on is not so much that, but how about this? What are we to do until he does return? That's what I want to talk about and talk about three key things that you and I need to be focused on as we await his return. And, and no mistake about it, Jesus is coming back, amen? He is coming back for his bride, the church, and we do need to be ready. But what are we to do meanwhile? Because God hasn't called us just to, to exist on the earth. We're here for a purpose, amen? Okay, so the first thing is this. He's called us to do business till he comes. And the scripture for that is in Luke chapter 19. We're going to begin reading uh, from verse 11. So Luke 19, verse 11, reading from New King James Version. Now as they heard these things, he, Jesus, spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So let's just stop for a minute. So even 2,000 years ago, the disciples were thinking, hey, you're going to rule and reign right now, right, Jesus? You know, you're coming to Jerusalem. This is it, right? It wasn't it. Jesus was going to rule and reign, but here's how he was going to rule and reign. He was going to give his life on the cross of Calvary as a sacrifice for you and I, as a substitute for you and I, so that his presence, his Holy Spirit, could come and live inside of us, so that the kingdom of God could come and live inside every believer. That was the purpose of his first coming. And the disciples, again, because Old Testament prophecy, sometimes it isn't seen that obvious. In other words, it's kind of mixed together. They're thinking, okay, you're going to return, you're going to rule and reign, and yeah, oh yeah, we got, we got God, you know, he'll be here with us as well. And they didn't see that there was going to be a gap between those two things. His inner kingdom to the external kingdom that's yet to come, Amen. But we've got hindsight's what, 2020. We can look back and say, well, obviously that was clear. Well, it wasn't so obvious to them. So let, let's read on and see what he says with this parable. He says, therefore, so he speaks a parable to show them what's going to happen. He said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded those servants, these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then, so verse 18, then came the first saying, master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said, said to him, well done, good, good servant, because you were faithful in very little. Have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here's your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you were, you were an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. By the way, not good things to say to Jesus, okay? Just so you know. All right, verse 22. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. But they said to him, Master, he's got 10 minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. So this is a parable that Jesus is telling. What is a parable? It's a, it's a kind of a, an illustration, something in the natural for you to understand a spiritual truth. And so literally, Jesus is the nobleman, all right? Let's just, you know, there's been a lot of interpretation of this, but the basic one is this. Jesus is the nobleman, and he, he, he has given and trusted his servants 
with some money, with some minus. And the same as you and I, we've been entrusted with time and talents and treasures. God has given us each these things in different varying ways and different amounts. It makes us unique to one another. But he's given these to us, right? And so then, and it says this nobleman, Jesus, has left for a while, right? And so then these guys, they're, they're left to invest and to do all the things that they do. Do business, right? Now, a lot of people think, well, do business. So does that mean that Jesus wants me to be involved as a businessman? Well, maybe, Maybe that is your calling and your gifting to provide finances for the kingdom to advance. But here's the thing, when it says do business, it means to be about the kingdom's business, to do what God has called us to do. And so he comes back, right? But before he comes back, it says there was a delegation sent saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. Well, who's that? That's talking about the unbelievers, the people in the world that want to rule and reign over themselves. They want to do their own thing. They don't want Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. And so we know people in the world like that, right? Who have rejected Christ at this point. And so that's what this is talking about. But then Jesus does return, right? Nobleman comes back and the servants have to do what? Give an accounting. Guess what? You and I one day will give an accounting for what God has entrusted us with. Now again, not so that we will be condemned to death or anything like that, but rather that we could be blessed. He's, you know, the one got 10 cities to rule over, another five cities. In other words, the idea is to take what's been given to us and use it for the kingdom. And God will bless us as we have blessed him with that. And so he comes back and you got this one guy who says, look at, you know, you're a cheapskate. But here's the thing. Jesus, the nobleman, gave the same amount to all three. And yet this one person has this attitude. And so what happens? You know, that person then, even what he has, is taken from him because he's unwilling to invest it in kingdom things. And I think there's a truth there, right? We could do a whole sermon on that, that if you don't use it, you lose it, right? And, and the thing is to, to advance the kingdom of God to whatever we've got. Now, here's the problem. You and I look around, and we see some people, oh, man, well, of course they're gifted. You know, of course God can use them. And, and we don't, I don't have that gift. And, 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 well, this is all you've given me. Stop thinking like that. But rather, think about this, that God ascended. Here's what it, the word says in Ephesians, that Jesus ascended to heaven and gave gifts to mankind. And you were a recipient of those gifts. And, and yeah, all those things, the talents and treasures and, and all those things. God has given you each a uniqueness in him. Gifts. And the thing is, don't worry about what so-and-so's got or, or this person's got. But Lord, what do I do with what you've given me? So the first question you have to ask is, what, what have I got? For some of us, we're ignorant even of that. And we haven't even taken the time to ask the Lord that. Lord, what have you given me? And to begin to grow in the knowledge and understanding of that and develop those things in your life that bring honor and glory to him. You see, why do we have all this? It's for one purpose and one purpose only, for the harvest. It's all about the harvest. It's always been about the harvest. Jesus came to give his life, to sow himself as a seed so that he could die and grow and produce a harvest of which we are. The Bible says he's the first fruits of a great harvest. So God has called you and I to be about the harvest, to do what he's called us to do, to do business until he comes. And the business is harvest. Listen to me. You know people that I don't know. You know people that only you have a unique relationship with that you can share Jesus with. And maybe you can even use words if you need to. Now, what do I mean by that? Sometimes we're all worried about, what do I say? Listen to me. The greatest witness begins by your example, by your attitude, by your character. Demonstrate Jesus that way. And then when words are necessary, it's easy. Because that person says, man, I see that you're different. I see how you treat others. I see how you, you have a, a sunny disposition even when difficult things are going on in your life. Let me tell you something. That is the greatest voice of the gospel, you being different from the way the world responds to things. Amen? So I just encourage you with that. All right. So, so first step, right, is uh, do business until he comes. And what is that? Just be about our master's business. And it's about the harvest. It's about being blessed so we can be a blessing to others. Okay, next one is this. Don't get sidetracked. This is a big one, all right? Uh, Matthew chapter 24. You're in good company because people in the Bible got sidetracked as well. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 3. Now, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us 
when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. I love this. Here's the disciples 2,000 years ago speaking to Jesus as he's just sitting there. Say, Jesus, you know, give us the inside scoop. You know, when, when's this all going to happen? And does Jesus rebuke them? Does he say, look, it's, that's none of your business. Don't worry about it. He doesn't say that at all. He actually answers them. So here's my point. It's okay for you and I to be concerned about end times. It's okay for you and I to wonder what's going to happen. Here's why I can say that. All the scriptures we're reading is actually from the Gospels, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This covers the three and a half years that Jesus walked on this earth in an open ministry, all right? That's three and a half years. And yet here he is in Matthew 24. We're not going to read it all, but 23, 24, 25. Here he is spending time talking about the end times. So if it's important to him to spend time talking about it here, then it should be important to you and I. Why? Because it, it gives us a stability to do what we're called to do now when we're secure in what the future holds. Amen? How many people want to be secure in your future? Amen? We need that. Because if you're not, what happens is you get worried about it more than what's going on right here and now. And so we need that security. Amen? That's what we're talking about today. So Matthew 3, uh, 24, Matthew 24, verse 3. Now verse 4. We read verse 3. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound and love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And so here's Jesus, and he makes it very clear. A whole bunch of stuff's going to happen, right? Now, in all that list that was read, is there anything yet that hasn't happened according to that list? It's all happening, right? We've got tribulations, we've got wars and rumors of wars, pestilences, earthquakes, you name it. It's all happened and been happening for thousands and thousands of years. So here's what Jesus is saying. Stuff's going to happen. I'm paraphrasing, bringing all that down. Stuff is going to happen, right? Small T tribulations are going to happen. Now for us directly involved, it may seem like big T tribulations. You think of World War I, it was called the, the war to end all wars. And let me tell you something, many preachers were saying, we're near the end, Jesus is going to come back. World War II came along, same kind of thing was said. Different wars, different, uh, when, when the pandemic came, you know, you had, oh, this is the end, you know. And I remember praying about it, saying, Lord, you know, is this, is this the end? He goes, yeah, look it, just keep going. <laughs> that's what Jesus told me. He just said, don't worry about it, it's going it's to be fine, keep on going. And the thing is, that's what you and I need to do, is not get sidetracked. We have an election coming up in another eight months. Now the rhetoric is going to start ramping up. It's already starting. Are you and I to get caught up in that? I hope not. Our job is to vote for the most godly person on the ballot, whether it's a president or right down to local people in, in, our, or in our neighborhood, if you know what I'm saying. That's our job. But to get caught up in the rhetoric of it, you're wasting God's time that he gave you. Now listen, I'm just being honest. Some of you don't want to hear this because you get caught up in it because you're listening to it and you get all riled up and then, uh, stop it. That's what the world does. God has called us to a mission here and that's to keep our eyes fixed on him. And yes, we're to pray for our government leaders. We're to do all of that and vote for the person or the man or the woman that we believe is the most godly in the race. Do all of that, but don't get caught up in the talk and talk and talk about it. Because let me tell you something. It, the devil is laughing his head off at Christians who've gotten sidetracked into the political arena. So be aware of that. And there's other things we can get caught up in, right? The things of this world we can get sidetracked in. The list goes on and on of how we can get sidetracked in these things. Amen? So we just need to be aware of it. Uh, <laughs> we, we, yeah. I'm not going to say this. We'll move on. All right. So... 
Here's, so do business until I come. Don't get sidetracked. And how about this? Here is the third and most, well, actually before that. Let me just say this. Matthew 24, 14. It's the last verse we read. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then what does it say? The end will come. Listen, we may not know the day or the hour, but here's what this scripture says. That the gospel will go to all the corners of the earth, then the end. Let me tell you something. That's only been possible in the last hundred years or so. In the last hundred years, we've got radio and then television came in, satellite technology. We've got ships and planes and, and, and boats and, and all kinds of mannerism in which we can reach all the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All in this last hundred years, essentially. Before that, we couldn't, all right? You know, there's a, a man by the name of David Livingston. How many people have heard that name? You may have read it somewhere. He was an evangelist, a, a missionary back in the uh, early to mid-1800s. And so he was asked, so he, he shared the gospel. That was his main thing. But he was also an explorer. And so he was asked to go locate the, the source of the Nile River. That was his job. So he actually traveled uh, to Africa and actually where modern-day Zambia is, a place where I'm going in just a couple of weeks. And so there's actually a place, a city called Livingston. So, you know, named after him. So he went, he never did find the source. But for him to get there from England, it took months and months by ship. You know, in fact, there's a saying, that, that, a true saying, that when missionaries went to Africa, they actually packed their belongings in a coffin. Because the idea was you were going to die there and get shipped back. So you might as well take a coffin on your way. And he did die there. He was 60 years old when he passed away. Died, there's all kinds of sicknesses there. Typhoid and, and uh, diphtheria, dysentery. You know, the list goes on and on of the nasty stuff. So, so when I'm going, I'm, I got more pokes in my arm than I, I don't even want to think about it. I've been vaccinated against anything and everything almost. And so when I go, listen, I'm going to get there from here. It's going to take me like less than a day. And I'm going to be right there in Zambia. He took months and months to get there. You know, he got sick and dealing with all kinds of illnesses and sicknesses. By faith in Jesus, plus being obedient to do all the stuff I'm supposed to do, I won't get sick. He's, and then I'll be back in a day. So look at how things have changed since just the mid-1800s. 150 years of time completely changed. Can I tell you, we're closer to the end than we've ever been. And we need to be aware of that, be conscious of it, not freaked out about it, but just conscious of the harvest around us as we're preparing for his imminent return. Amen? And so, you know, pray for me. <laughs> you know, as, as we go there, uh, we go there, again, some people might wonder, well, why are we going there? We've established a, a bunch of Bible schools in Zambia. I think there's over 50 schools there now, and I'm going to a, a graduation. They've completed their two years of study. And so we actually, as a church, are involved in, in Bible schools in three countries, in Haiti, in Dominican Republic, and in Zambia. And so we're just really excited about this graduation coming up. So just keep that in prayer that God is glorified as we equip these leaders to affect the gospel around the earth. Now listen, you might say, I'm going to digress for a minute before I carry on my message that just came to me. Listen, next week you can be involved in missions without leaving the church building. You might say, well, how can I do that? Well, we're stuffing eggs. And you might say, what has that got to do with Jesus? Can I tell you, it's got everything to do with Jesus. Because what's going to happen in Palm Sunday, a week later, hundreds of kids are going to come because we're going to put thousands of eggs out on our 30 acres for them to find. So it's not about the eggs. What's it about? It's about the kids. It's about the parents. It's about the people who will come on our grounds. Why? Because we put a, a stupid little egg with a little candy in it so they could come and discover it. It's not about the egg, but sometimes that's what missions is about. Sometimes that's what the harvest is about. Sometimes we get fixated, well, I have to, you know, say this and bring that person to Jesus right now. Listen to me. It may begin by putting some candy in an egg so the kid could come to church. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes we get, we get so uh, religious about this, and we need to realize that the harvest requires workers doing all kinds of different things. Amen? So this. Side story with that. All right. So, do business till I come. What's the second one? Don't get sidetracked. And here's the third one. Watch and pray. Okay. So here's the scripture for that. Mark 13, beginning at verse 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, 
nor the Son, but only the Father. So you can see this is repeated again in another gospel. Verse 33, take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house, gave authority to his servants to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So what? We're to watch and pray, right? You know, because Jesus is going to be returning. And so what does it mean to watch? It means don't be lethargic. Don't fall asleep at your post. You know, the idea is that, you know, you, you are alert and aware of what's going on around you. So I, I am not in any way suggesting that you shouldn't be aware of the wars and the rumors of wars and the trials and the tribulations. You should be aware of it. You know, we should be the most informed people on planet Earth. We really should be. But in that information that we don't let it overwhelm us. But rather we're aware of what's going on. And then what's the other part? Watch and what's the other part? Pray. So what does that mean? It means to talk to God, but more importantly, to be in communion with God. So the idea is, it's not that you, you hear or see something going, oh God, you know, we're all going to die. You know, the, the sky is falling. That's not the kind of prayer we're talking about. But rather you go to God and say, Lord, you know, I hear that this is going on. How am I to intercede for that situation? What's my part in this? How can I use this which was meant for evil for good? Let me tell you something. Some of these uh, wars and that, they make great conversation starters to share Jesus. Because listen to me, your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, they're freaked out. Some of you are freaked out, and I pray that by the time I'm done, you're less freaked out. But some of them are really freaked out because they don't have a sure hope of their future. And you can come along and say, yeah, you know, the Bible talks about that, you know, very clearly. But you can have peace even in the midst of the tribulation. What a great end to share the gospel, amen? So take things that are meant for evil instead of letting it be evil in your life but say, man, I can turn this for good for Jesus. That's what God wants you and I to do, amen? To watch and pray, to be aware of what's going on around us. Okay, so I circle back around to the question. Are we staying or are we going? So here's my answer. Yes. <laughs> so so let, let's just take a few minutes and talk about this, okay? What we've been talking about here is the small t tribulations. Now, when I say small t, it doesn't mean they're not little things. These, some of these things are big deals, all right? People are losing their lives. At this very moment in time, the conflict in Ukraine, uh, the conflict in the Gaza Strip, what's going on with Israel, people are perishing at this very moment in time. As, as we take a breath, someone is giving up their last breath and departing this world. So these are, are in a sense, big tribulations to them. But compared to the tribulation... The big T one, there's nothing to compare to that. And that's found primarily in the book of Revelations, uh, and we're not going to get deeply into that. But here's the thing. What needs to be our attitude towards the book of Revelations and the tribulation? Because listen, it talks about a whole bunch of the earth being burned up. It talks about plagues and sicknesses and ships being destroyed and people perishing. You know, it's scary. How many people admit you read Revelation? It's freaking scary, all right? It really is. You read it, you're like, oh my God. You know, and for some Christians, it freaks them out. And I get it. I remember as a young believer reading this and, oh my golly. You know, I'm, I'm, it says that all of them are going to die going through it. This is bad, right? So how are we to look at this? Because here's the thing. If you're so scared because of that, then you're going to struggle with doing what you're called to do here and now. Okay. So let's talk about, first of all, the rapture. Now, some of you right away, if you're, you're, you've been around theology for a while, you're going to say, but Pastor Carl, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. Okay, again, for those that are theologically, you've had this beat into you. The word rapture is actually a Latin word. So it's taken from the Latin version of the Bible, which you and I don't use usually, but we borrowed that term, the rapture. And here's what it means. The catching away or the snatching away of the church. Now it's harpezo is the Greek word, okay? Not that it matters much, but even though the word rapture is not found in our English Bible, the term or the definition of it, of the church being caught away, is in the Bible, okay? So it's very clear that there's a catching away of the church. The question is for you and I is when is that? 
You know, and so again, if people here, some of you have studied this or been under teaching, you know, often there's a, a, a pre-trib rapture. In other words, before the seven years start, you know, that's when the church is taken. There's another group of people that say, well, mid-trib, that that's when the church is going to be taken. And then there's this other group that say, well, it's not really going to happen. It's like at the end of the tribulation, you're going to go through it all, and you're kind of going to go up and come back again. All right? So that's the, the three common theological thinkings of the church being caught away. So listen to me. I have a master's of theology, a doctor of ministry, and I still don't know for sure what the answer is. All right, so listen to me. But here's what I will tell you. I come from a very simple background. I'm a farm boy from rural Canada, and I like to take God's word at what it says. Anyone else here like that? Like, you know, and, and I know that there's people that do numbers and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and, you know, lots of Edgar Wise knots around. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Predicting things. Can I give you just two portions of Scripture that should help you and bring peace to your heart? Can, can I do that this morning for a couple minutes? All right. So let me just do this to you, okay, or for you. And so let's look, first of all, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 and 10. Just a short verse, verses. For God did not appoint us to suffer His wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. All right. So let's look at this for a minute. So it says, God did not appoint us to suffer his wrath. All right. Wrath means punishment, judgment. All right. Bad. Okay. You don't, definitely don't want to be under God's wrath. All right. But to do what? Receive salvation. Now remember, this book is being written to believers. Okay, so this is important. So to do what? Receive salvation. That word salvation, a lot of times we think, oh, just to be saved and going to heaven. No, the, this word sozos, this word salvation means more than that. It means that, but it means to be delivered, to help, you know, to not, be suf not suffer. Okay, that's literally what it means. Through who? Jesus. And I love this. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep. So that doesn't mean that you were sleeping last night, all right? Whether you're asleep or awake. That's not what it means. It means whether you've died already or you're awake, meaning we're still on the earth, we may live together with him, all right? In other words, we'll never be separated from him. Can you say amen to that? All right, so, so that's kind of like a foundation. Now, let me show you one more verse to simplify everything, okay? So here's what it's saying. God hasn't appointed us to suffer wrath. That's what it says, right from the Bible. All right, let's look at Revelation 16, verse 1, just one verse. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And then you go on and read and a whole bunch of bad stuff happens, all right? God's wrath. But what, what did we read in the first scripture we read? We have not been called to suffer wrath, but to obtain salvation. Yet here we see clearly God's wrath is being poured out. So either the scriptures are wrong. In other words, we're, we're going to go through the tribulation, which, listen to me, scripture is not wrong. Or we need to understand what this is saying. So let me give you a simple illustration. I've got five kids in my family, all right? Five kids, they're all growing up now and have families of their own, you know, they're married and gone. But when they were little, there were times that some of them did things wrong. I know you, I know you find that hard to believe. But I will tell you that the one boy who happens to be the assistant pastor was the worst. <laughs> he was the worst. He was the most stubborn of all of them. Like, I mean, bad, all right? And he got his older brother in trouble all the time. We didn't find that out till a while later, but we figured it out. And, and a couple of daughters, man, they were handfuls, all right? So here's the thing, though. They never all got in trouble at the same time. You get what I'm saying? In other words, sometimes a couple of the kids, they were even away, maybe at a friend's house, and then a couple of them got into trouble. So as a parent, do you gather all the kids together and say, look, it, Jonathan was bad. Rebecca was really bad. I'm just going to punish all of you. Would, would any sane parent do that? And listen, if you do that, you need to come and talk to me because that would be wrong if you did that. Because the persons or persons that did what was wrong need to be dealt with. But the others didn't do anything wrong. And so they shouldn't be punished. They shouldn't be under wrath. It's exactly how this is. We've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have been washed in the blood of Jesus. We have been declared clean in his sight. And we're sons and daughters of the Most High, all right? And then there's a whole bunch of other people who haven't accepted Jesus yet. And so the reason is now something has to happen. I'm not going to punish. God is not going to punish 
the children who haven't done anything wrong. He's going to remove them out of the picture. And that's literally what happens here. Somewhere along the way, now listen, I'll be honest with you, I was a pre-tribber guy, hardened pre-tribber. I could preach on it, I could teach on it, I could show you that's, that's for sure what's going to happen. Let me tell you something that's changed over the years for me. It could be pre-trib, but it could be up to mid-trib. Now, why can I say that? The tribulation, this seven-year time of what's going to happen, actually, the bad stuff doesn't happen for the la- till the last three and a half. So the first three and a half, Satan is preparing, doing different things, but it all seems all nice for the first three and a half years. And then the Bible says that three and a half years, the devil is seen for who he is, truly is. And then the wrath of God gets poured out. So here's what I believe. Again, whether you believe different, that's okay. But as long as you have confidence and faith in what you believe, that's okay. But here's what I believe. That somewhere at the start or towards the middle of the tribulation is when the church is taken out of the way so that God can pour out his judgment upon everyone else. And you might say, well, why is God doing it? He's doing it, and you can read it for yourself in Revelation. We're not going there today. So that they might repent and turn to God. So why do you punish a child? Just to punish the child? No, so that they might stop being bad, right? That's the whole idea. Well, the thing is, that's the same for God. As he's pouring out this, it's so that they can recognize he is the king of kings and lord of lords and turn and repent and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's what it's all about. So are we staying or are we going? Yes, we're staying till he comes back to take us to go. Amen? Let me close with this one scripture verse just to bring this all together. 1 John 5, verse 20. We know God's Son has come. He has given us the understanding to know Him who is the true God. We are joined together with the true God through His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and the life that lasts forever. Let's stand together. Just look at that scripture for a minute as you stand. We know God's Son has come. He came already once, church. And he gave his life on the cross of Calvary. That's a for sure thing. It's a historical truth, right? And he's going to return again. And he's given us an understanding. We can know him and walk with him. Listen, if you're listening to my voice online or you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, listen, I don't want to scare you, but you don't want to go through the tribulation. You don't want to go through that. Now, if I can scare you out of hell to go to heaven, then that's what I'm going to do. But let me tell you something. God's love is the most amazing thing. That's the other side of the coin, so to speak. You don't want to come to Jesus out of fear. You want to come to him out of faith and trust. He loves you so much. He gave his life so that that you could be saved from the wrath to come. This age of grace that we've experienced now will one day come to an end. And accepting Jesus now is your best decision. So, Father, I thank you for every person here. And, and Lord, right now, and the Lord showed me this earlier. Lord, I pray right now for those that live in a continual fear. It kind of goes up and down depending on how conscious they are of their future. Living in fear, even as a believer of what's going to happen. Lord, I come against that spirit of fear right now in Jesus' name. You haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So, Lord, right now, I come against that fear that, Lord, it's replaced with a peace and a joy that you have everything under control, that one day that trumpet will sound and we will be snatched up and be with you forever in heaven. Lord God, I thank you that you've got a plan, you know what you're doing, and we entrust our lives to you. So, Lord, just as I close this prayer, here's my prayer, Lord God, for every person here. You've given each person a harvest field some very large, some smaller. But Lord, you've entrusted us with souls that are around us that we have a unique connection with. Help us to be a light for you. For Lord, the time is drawing near to the end. Whether it be tomorrow, next week, next year, a hundred years from now, but it's drawing to an end. So Lord, give us a diligence to know that, to have that just in the back of our mind but to be aware of what's going on here and now around us. Lord God, that we would be about our master's business, doing business till you come. That Lord God, that we wouldn't get sidetracked by all the the sideshows that this world has, focused on you, and that we would watch and pray, staying connected with you. 
So bless each person as they walk in a greater confidence and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning.